Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Hold My Dream, where we navigate the news and politics with a chaser of civility. I'm your host, Jen, inviting you to grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and imagine with us how to create a new American identity together. Welcome to this week's Hold My Drink and Counterweight podcast with my co-host, David Bernstein. Uh, Today, we have Dr. Sheena Mason in the house with us. Dr. Sheena Mason just got her PhD with distinguishment, with honors from Howard University. She is now teaching at SUNY, and I might say this wrong, is it Onionto? How do you say Oni? Onianta. Onianta. Um, and, but what's really fascinating about Sheena and what we're here to talk to her today is her theory of racelessness. But before we do, Sheena, did you bring a drink to this conversation? (laughs) Yes, I have an iced coffee. It has been sitting on my desk for too long. So I don't know that it's good to drink still, but I have a drink. (laughs) I feel bad because people do this just for me. They'll be like, okay, fine. I pulled a drink up. Um, David, I know you have water today. So I mean, you're not, yes. Okay. So I, but I do have something exciting. It's been a long day. David and I have been doing a couple of things this morning. And so I have coffee, but I found a new whiskey and it's not the peanut butter whiskey. It is peanut butter cup whiskey Ooh. that I put in my nice. coffee. That sounds nice. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I need to start getting like endorsements for doing this, right? Um, anyways. Right. <laughs> Dr. Sheena, you have got a theory of racelessness that I think you just need, we just need to start with us telling you telling us a little bit about yourself and where you came to this theory, and then we'll get into what the theory is and ask you questions and so on. Sure. Um, Oh, man, where do I start? So (laughs) my PhD is in English literature. I specialize in African American, American and Caribbean literature. And it was through my study of literature that this thing that I have now dubbed theory of racistness came to fruition. Ultimately, as I'm studying the literature, as I'm, which involves obviously a deep analysis of history, a deep analysis of um, genealogies of various words, also a deep analysis of, of society and culture, and studying society, culture, and history in other places, I came to see within African American literature the tendency for the most marginalized and usually excluded voices or texts uh, and also the treatment of canonized texts and canonized writers, I came to see this practice of showing the undoing of race as the solution to undo the problem of racism. And it was a writer and artist who really pushed my thinking in this direction even further and started giving me the language to describe what I was seeing both in to be true in literature and what I was seeing as clearly relevant to today's society was Barbara Chase Rabot. She has a sculpture called The Albino and she has a poem in her collection of poetry called The Albino as well. And then she has this fictional account of of Sally Hemings and the life of Sally Hemings. And it was those combinations of of readings, both reading the sculpture and reading the text, that I came to to start to put language to what I was seeing consistently in the literature and in um, the public sphere. And that ultimately was this identification of, of the sameness of race and racism, which was then leading people to illustrate how to undo racism, we have to undo race. And that was the really the start of the philosophy. It's, I call it a theory of racistness, but really it's speaking to philosophies of race. Um, that was the start, that was the genesis. Hmm. So do, we've talked before, so I have a sense of this, but you don't believe that there's anything distinctly cultural about the black community or segments of the black community um, or, or whites or, and you believe that it's a complete construct. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
yeah, I don't think it's a construction. So that's so, and we should start at the beginning for people who yeah. aren't familiar with the theory of racistness. So there are six philosophical positions. There's a whole specialization in the discipline of philosophy where people study and analyze philosophies of race. And philosophers say that there are six philosophies, three speak to what a person thinks race is, and three speak to what a person thinks should be done with race. And every single one of us has two, holds two of these philosophies without having a name for it. The first category is naturalism. If you are a naturalist, you believe that race is biological, it's in nature. The second category is constructionism. Most people in the United States are programmed, taught to be constructionists, that is to view race as a social construction. Most constructionists will concede that, okay, race isn't biological, it's not in nature, but that, but in some meaningful ways, in the ways you describe culturally, et cetera, it's real. I fall into the third category that speaks to what I think race is. I'm a skeptic. As a so-called racial skeptic, I argue that race does not exist in nature and it doesn't exist as a construction. And people, when I say that, people tend to hear constructionism and skepticism as being the same thing. It is not because fundamentally constructionists say that race doesn't exist, but then they operate within the category of race. So they say it doesn't exist, but they say it exists socially. I say it doesn't exist full stop. It does not exist. And the thing that people point to and say is race, it's ethnicity, something that does exist. It's culture, as you just said, which gets these things get conflated with the idea of race. So for me, when I say something like black culture or white culture doesn't exist, I'm not discounting the fact that there aren't di different cultures or ethnicities. I'm saying those things aren't the same as race. It's not racial. Um, and, and sometimes- well, there, could be a as, particular, there could be a particular uh, black ethnicity in a particular place. Like there could be a particular ethnicity of white people who live in West Virginia and have a, uh, have a certain lifestyle. And that could, you could say that's sort of like an ethnic identity more than it is anything else. And it's not really uh, defined by race. Right, because I wouldn't say that it's a white ethnicity or a black ethnicity. I wouldn't say that. I would discount. I would discount right. the attributing sure. of race or racial language to said ethnicity. Um, right. And but can I interrupt I think, there? So what would you? So course. what would you say if if there was you know let's you know a, a, like David said, there's a certain group you know primarily white has a certain kind of culture in, in West Virginia, what, what would you just, would you, would you literally just use the words to say there is a culture in West Virginia, you know, around this town that does X, Y, and Z? Is that how you would, are, are you saying that in terms of defining culture, we need to be more precise in our language? I think we can be more precise, but I also think our desire to constantly separate and divide ourselves from each other is a nefarious endeavor because then it enables and empowers and inspires people in seeing and recognizing and pinpointing these differences mm -hmm. to divide themselves from, from other people. I think that what we should be striving toward is recognizing American as an ethnicity, as an ethnicity that encompasses all of these various differences that, to your point, Jen, speak to region more than it speaks to race, speaks to class, socioeconomic status, right? Speaks to religion, religious practices. There are countless ways in which America, if we think of America and American as an ethnicity, encompasses and should encompass all of us. But because we fall victim, we fall into the trap of believing in the unicorn of race, we are encouraged to view ethnicity and culture through racialist lenses, which then precludes us from recognizing how the idea of American was founded on the idea of whiteness. In fact, right, if we look at the founding documents, there are countless people who are excluded and precluded from what it is to be American. And instead of 
contending with that fact in a way that writes the all of us into what it is to be American now that we've gotten closer to living up to American ideals we've accepted that dis, those distinctions in large we've hyphenated ourselves onto American right African American Asian American Chinese Italian whatever Jewish American we hyphenate ourselves so that American as a concept still comes to be understood as speaking about a certain type of whiteness, a category that, again, doesn't actually exist, and everyone else gets hyphenated. I think the way that we get the way that we get to the unification we say we want is by recognizing how American represents all of us, represents all of us ethnically. And if we really feel like we have to be more particular, more specific about, about ethnicity and by extension and culture, then we step outside of the box of racism and um, we look at region, right? Which again, there are many communities that are still largely segregated because of the history of racism, but there are just as many communities who aren't. So you can't look at a particular community or region and say, oh, this is a white fill in the blank or a black fill in the blank. And you have thinkers like Zora Neale Hurston who who problematized this way of thinking. People looked at her literature and said, oh, this is black literature because it's black dialect. And she comes with Sarah Fonda Swanee and she says, it's not black dialect, it's Southern. (laughs) It's Southern dialect, A, a white person and a black person speak the same in the South. That that was her view, right? But again, because we want to insert the idea of race into everything, we are prevented from seeing our similarities. So if we remove the category of race and view it as a nonsensical thing that it truly is, we would have a more proliferated understanding of ethnicity and culture, and we would have more precise language. But I think that the a more ambitious and and freeing goal and unifying and healing goal would be to recognize how American encompasses and can embrace all of us as a category. So I I like the idea of transcending race. And I like the idea of, of course, aspirational to sort of have a transcendent American identity. I think we can have that irrespective of whether there are distinct cultures. The thing about culture that to me requires, um, you know, kind of continued consideration of is that I think it explains certain things, right? Like, like there's, and I don't think you can get out of that explanation so easily. Uh, you know, I, the race to me doesn't explain anything, but, um, but uh, culture, um, you know, if, if you take a certain um, culture of people who live in West Virginia, and they have a certain set of values, and those values may be wonderful in some respects for their adaptability and and not so wonderful in other respects for their adaptability in society. Though, the, uh, how do I, I can't pretend that doesn't exist because, it's, because it explains something. I mean, you can look at any culture. My, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish. It's not, I, by that, I mean, as much as a cult, I do a culture as I would a religion. And that, you know, there are certain traits that not every Jew shares, but a lot of us do that are recognizable. You know, um, I, I have a piece on Jewish debate culture, for example, that I've written recently. And, um, you know, to me, that that's something that other ethnicities or cultural groups can share, too. But it's something you see more in certain segments of the Jewish community. Um, you know, I think you could say, you know, um, I'm, I'm married to an Asian woman who happens to have some traits of a tiger mom. And that is a distinct cultural feature that may make it more likely that our kids are going to succeed ac- academically, but also give them make it more likely they're going to have mental health issues too. And and I and I and to me those are important distinctions because they help explain differences that we need to understand if we're going to actually deal with with problems that emerge. And so I'm not sure how we get around the existence of culture as an explanatory factor, even if it's not an aspirational one. Maybe but, you can help me out. But what you're saying isn't in any way, at least from my analysis, what you're saying isn't in any way contending with what I'm saying. Because what I'm saying is 
what you're talking about is not racial. It's right. not it's race. Culture. So if it's it's culture, which is not racial. Race doesn't produce culture. Co- co- it's the other way around. Culture produces race. So all of the things you're saying, um, I would hold as true, except the thing that gets dubbed black culture. Let's focus on black culture. The thing that gets dubbed black culture, for example, it's really, you're talking about socioeconomic stuff. You're talking about class. So the idea that it's black, that it's racial, then gives people the false idea that more people, the majority of so-called black people fit into a certain box or a certain category so that when somebody like Angel comes around, Angel Eduardo comes around or somebody like B or somebody like Thomas Chatterton Williams or somebody like Camille Foster or any number of countless examples that we can point to who problematize the box that black blackness and to participate authentically in black culture is supposed to what that's supposed to mean, instead of recognizing how racism is creating this idea of blackness. And so maybe we it's not a valid category of, or it's its something else is at hand because most people who are racialized as black don't fit into that box very neatly. Instead of uh, more people coming to that sort of line of inquiry or questioning, we continue to say, oh, no, but it's a real thing. But it's not because the vast majority of racialized black people in this country are not poor. The vast majority of racialized black people in this country speak standard English and not the you know, stereotypical slang, what's called black English or African-American vernacular English. We don't speak that. We speak we speak the standard right? The vast majority of us, it's like the same percentage of us get bachelor's degrees. So the vast majority of us are accused of talking white when we speak how I'm speaking with you now, which then infers that to talk black is to, to talk the slang that I'm talking about. And make no mistake, there's a hierarchy that comes with that recognition, because what you're saying is to, to sound or talk white is to sound intelligent and articulate. So what's the opposite of that? What does that mean for from a black cultural perspective? It's the opposite. And in, in a lot of ways, the ideas that people have around what white culture is or what black culture is, we see this playing out in very nefarious ways right now where people are accused of having white ideas and math is being dubbed as white. And by extension, what a person is usually saying is that anything that we attach with whiteness is 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 racist right and so the the in the implications of the, those ideas and the acceptance that white culture is this thing that prioritizes things like punctuality and higher education yeah. is to say that to have to be black and to participate in black culture is the opposite of that. And that's mm. that's what I'm discounting. It's I those see. You ideas. want to essentialize black culture, but you're not denying that there are certain segments of people who have you would have called black who 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 share some uh cultural features with each other, right? Just like there are certain that you know, and it may not be, it may be regional, it may be, it may be in a particular location. But but you're not saying that those cultural features don't exist at all in anybody, right? I'm saying that those features are American, though. So I I don't even think that it again because because race doesn't exist for me. I'm able to see I think more clearly what mm-hmm. culture is and what it isn't. And be, like we've been taught and encouraged to segregate even culture and like our ideas of ourselves and other people, we've been taught to segregate those things and to uphold the segregation as a positive thing, right? But in reality, if we look at mainstream American culture, the so what we could point to and say, oh, this is black culture, primarily because black people might be um might be the actors of it, right? 
that same culture is being consumed by the masses of Americans, you know, there. So how is it, how is it black culture? If the larger society consumes that same thing, I have the same thing with this idea of black history. Mm -hmm. How is it black history when it's, it's American history, but because we're taught to segregate the idea of culture and history, we're then taught to continue to perpetuate the racism that comes with it. So I'm not, discounting the fact that there are various ways in which people participate in culture. What I'm discounting is this idea that it's, that race has I anything gotcha. to do with mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Right. That's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I have a 24 year old son who's a musician who sings R and B music. I mean, that's what he loves. Like he's loved it yeah. since he was 11 yes. years old. And, um, and it's as much in his soul as that I believe any, Black music. I know we're trying to be raceless here, but it's okay. But it's just but, uh, talk. You talk. But, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, and and you know, and I, I think it is in the it is it is, a, and there's no reason why one has to associate that with that with a distinct with 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 blackness. One can say that's just a cultural feature in America. Um, that's an interesting way of looking but at is it. it and, and I don't think that's a, that detracts from anything. If anything, I think that right. elevates its significance. Mm-hmm. Right. Because we're honoring the fact that my ancestors who were enslaved, which isn't true for every racialized black person in this country, by the way. But for me, it is true. And my ancestors, they are American. They built America. You know, there was a severance from the continent of Africa for my ancestors so that when they came over to these grounds, just like the early Europeans, they created a new culture they created something new and that to me is it's like we could mourn the loss right of what could have been and we can also celebrate what happened because of that because of that trauma because of that violence and what happened is the creation of an entirely new nation and what happened with the creation of a new nation is a creation of an entirely new culture that has its tentacles in across the globe right yes it does across the entire globe and so cultural formation you know culture doesn't exist and get created in a vacuum it gets created it's multi-directional it has tentacles everywhere and the sooner more people can can embrace that reality about culture the sooner we can get to the other side of unnecessarily hear me unnecessarily dividing ourselves from each other so Sheena, I, when I'm hearing you, and I, and I love the idea of of a of a, an American culture without the race, but it sounds to me that you're even saying, I mean, this is just like this is humanity, right? I mean, we are we're looking at each other as individuals. Is there something that would make an American culture with all of its bits and pieces? Because we're all from all over the world, right? So that makes us a bit unique. I guess maybe that's. I'm answering my own question, but th- that's different from a culture somewhere else. Is is it that we are this mishmash of people that makes it an American culture? What makes an American culture an American culture versus just humanity versus just individuality and recognizing that and everyone w- that we meet? I think what makes it American is the is the fact that it's rooted in this idea of nation, also a, a, a construction, right? <laughs> we imagine borders, we imagine walls, all of that. We have the symbol of the American flag and countless other symbols that speak to this idea of a united nation. So that's what makes it American. But what I say that the sort of amalgamation that happens in American society is unique to America, No, because we could look at countless other places where the same kind of, you know, globalization, um, interactions, similar histories, you know, um, exist. And in those places, culture would be created in the same kind of unique and different in different ways. Um, So I, I don't I think the thing that makes America unique then is inevitably the fact that we're talking about America. We're talking about a specific nation with a specific history. Um, Outside of that, I think that 
people should be encouraged to recognize shared humanity, right, across national borders, across ethnic differences, across gender, right, like across any label that one feels inclined to attach to the to oneself. I think we should be encouraged to see the universal and see the human again. And the fact that we live in a time where people are discounting the value of seeing shared humanity is a sad time, I think, for more people than not. Because why is it all of a sudden a scandalous thing for somebody like myself to say, there's one race, the human race, when it's factually correct? And why do people hear with with that sort of assertion, why do people hear that I'm not, I'm saying that I'm trying to erase who people are, or I'm trying to ignore the problems that exist? No, I'm actually trying to point to a material reality, a scientific reality. I'm trying to point to the fact and solve the problems that actually are pervasive in our communities, because our obsession with this thing called race and color, skin color, which is a proxy for it, continues the problem. And all of the ways in which people have historically and today are trying to solve the problem by infusing the idea of race and upholding it is having the unintended and sometimes intended effect of upholding the same problems we say we want to dismantle and destroy. So one needn't be a skeptic to be an eliminativist. You can be a social constructionist and be an eliminativist. So earlier I mentioned the three categories that speak to what a person thinks race is. The most contended category for most people is gonna be the skepticism, right? When I talk about theory of racistness, racelessness speaks to my recognition and helping people recognize their own racelessness. And it speaks to my practice of helping people de-racialize themselves in certain spaces to be more clear-eyed and astute about what racism is and how to solve the problem of racism. And hopefully more people are compelled than not to, with the right information, embrace skepticism and embrace their racelessness today, not just as an aspirational thing, but today. But In case that's not the case, racelessness also speaks to what I think should be done with race, which is, I think it should be eliminated. The the other um, philosophies that speak to what a person thinks should be done with race are conservationism, which which usually are gonna be naturalist because how can you do anything with nature except keep it, (laughs) right? Reconstructionism, which is the default position that most people in American society are programmed to fall into, reconstruct, let's reconstruct what race means for a variety of reasons. And if we look at the entire history of of the word race and the entire history in the American context of racism, we would come to find that it is impractical for us to think that we're going to achieve the end goal of eliminating racism by reconstructing the idea of race. Because since the creation of the word, the word has been under reconstruction. And since the word came over to the American context, people, abolitionists, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Jacobs, and other abolitionists tried to reconstruct what it means to be racialized as black in this country, to write their humanity into the category. And in 2021, when you have a movement like Black Lives Matter, again, saying the refrain of I'm black and I'm human, clearly trying to reconstruct what it means to be black, what it means, what race means in American society over a century apart from each other, that tells you that there's something about this idea, this endeavor to reconstruct the category that is proving to be a hang up and a problem for a reason. And for that reason, and many more, I'm in the last category, the last philosophy of race, which is I'm an eliminativist. From my position as a skeptic, I say race doesn't exist, racism does. Because racism is race. It's it's tricking us. It's masquerading itself. 
So in that way, I recognize that the thing that needs to be eliminated is the idea of race because that's that's how we undo racism because it's the same thing. And in, in that way, racelessness is an aspiration. But there are plenty of people historically and today who are constructionist eliminativists. So mm-hmm. one needn't be, one needn't agree with me on the existence or non-existence of the category uh, to conclude that eliminativism is the direction society should go. And big people like, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. would be a constructionist eliminativist. Um, Malcolm X, right before he's assassinated, if you really read his autobiography closely and you're aware of philosophies of race, you come to see his skepticism and eliminativism shining through, a very different Malcolm than in his younger years. And my mentor at Howard University, Jacoby Carter, is a constructionist eliminativist. He's who I learned from. Um, And I was formerly a constructionist eliminativist. But then something clicked for me and I recognized skepticism and I recognized and unlocked something in my mind that brought me to skepticism. Um, So I don't want to get people too hung up in the skepticism part (laughs) without also pointing and bringing attention to the eliminativism part, because we might not agree on construction or skepticism, but we might agree on the end goal, which I think is more important. Right. Have you faced a lot of backlash in your personal life for this? I mean, you went to a historically black college, um, you know, have when when you started to articulate these positions around among your peers, what was that like? How's that been for you personally? So I haven't experienced a lot of backlash. Um, And I would say that's a good (laughs) and positive thing. I would also say. It is kind of surprising. I could read a little bit of surprise on your faces when I said no, that. No, I mean, I'm not that shocked. I'm not that it shocked is, because I believe, it, it is I believe the Black community is much more diverse than, I, I know I'm using racialized language, but I believe that that um, people are much more diverse than they than they sometimes admit to or that people outside understand, you know. And, well, this is know, true. Think, this is true. And you know, the biggest obstacle I ran into, first of all, I resisted my own ideas. So if you listen to some of my podcasts, you know, I I talk about this in many places, I resisted my own ideas. Um, And I think Angel expressed a sort of similar experience. I was very, when, once I had the language, which the language I really had in, in the early iterations was this idea of to undo racism, we have to undo race. Once I had that and I could say it succinctly, I was hitting the brakes because I didn't want to be, first of all, I didn't want to be that black person. Okay. Because I'm very aware of how my, any part of my ideas can be completely misconstrued, taken off the tracks and then used for nefarious purposes and just painted and cast as like a wrong-headed thing, you know, very aware that I didn't want to be that person and I didn't want to be that black person. And I didn't want to let go of my blackness. That's how I looked at it at the time. I didn't want to let go of my blackness, even though my knowledge and my mind was showing me the answer key. I didn't want to let go. And I was in my mentor's office crying to her, my other mentor than the one I referenced earlier. And I was crying to her And I was like, I didn't, I didn't want to let go. And she told me, Sheena, just keep learning, keep going, keep, keep exploring, keep going down this path, write about it, publish about it, but you don't have to be the martyr to now say like, I'm not black. Right. And I said, okay. And I tried to, I tried to let that give me some comfort. And while I was exploring, you know, in, in reading and researching and learning everything I possibly could, I still called myself black, right? That's how I was a constructionist eliminativist. I still operated from it within the categories and I still um, viewed it as a positive thing, right? For me, my source of pride and my holding on to the category came from the fact that I conflated, uh, I conflated race 
thereby my blackness with everything positive, everything I am, including everything positive, right? So you'll have some people say some things like there's nothing positive about being black. I know precisely what they mean. The problem was that because I was inscribing everything positive that I really value about myself as a person to my race, it made it that much more painful and harder for me to imagine letting go of that and dismantling it, even though I know that because of how race operates in society, because racism and race are the same thing, it has to go that that's the inevitable conclusion. Um, and still, I still drove toward eliminativism. I drove toward racelessness as an aspiration. And, and maybe after a couple of years or so, the thing that unlocked me from that tension, the thing that unlocked me in my mind from feeling the pain that for me came with this idea of letting go of my blackness was recognizing the sameness of racism and race. So, which then forced me to recognize that in letting go of my race, letting go of my blackness, what I was doing was letting go of the violence and that's it. I wasn't letting go of, of how I participate in culture. I wasn't letting go of how, of my ethnicity, my DNA, my ancestry, whatever. I wasn't letting go of any of the positive attributes that I value in myself. I was just letting go of the violence of racism and racism is violent in more ways than I've been able to really talk about on any space because the conversations are so short, but it's like, the way a person feels, especially a person who's racialized as back as black, the way a person feels like a second class citizen, the way a person feels that in in certain spaces they're not going to be accepted or welcomed or seen or valued or understood, the way a person is trained to see microaggressions everywhere, the way a person is taught to believe that if I step outside of my house or my sons do. There, I'm at risk of getting shot by a cop just doing nothing just because I'm black. That's the language we use to describe somebody else's bad behavior. I'm the cause of it, just showing up into a space that is really nefarious. And in the same ways, we see this happening with how whiteness is being spoken about and taught and understood, right? That to be white is to be racist automatically and unquestioningly. We see to be racialized, if you can come to understand and have the knowledge that somebody like myself does, you come to recognize that there's nothing positive about it to be racialized in any way. There's no positive about it. And it might give some people practical utility. It has helped people survive and overcome. And it gives it by giving them a sense of pride, right, and value that doesn't exist within the construct itself, if we call it a construct. But outside of that, it's far better to re remove the violence than to cling to ideas of, of solidarity or unification because of the problem of racism. It's better to remove the violence. Um, I've been fortunate enough to receive an overwhelmingly positive response as opposed to any kind of backlash I think that but that's not to say that there aren't going to be some detractors right there are going to be people sort of across the spectrum who are just like on either ends of the the extreme ways of thinking about race so by this I mean like the super hardcore white supremacists very small minority but they do exist right who they need the idea of whiteness to, to continue to exist and persist um, because they need the idea of blackness and the other races to exist. And then you have like the super staunch sort of like pan-Africanist type of thinker who I'm, I'm like almost inevitably never going to compel to see the light in these particular ways and to agree because they also need this idea of race and blackness to exist. And so but those are such extremes that most people I find to be more closer to the center. And so they've responded very reasonably to me. And some of my students describe it as like, you know, one student in particular, she said, 
at first I thought you were crazy, but then I listened. And the more I listened, the more I heard. And then I realized you're just speaking facts. She might have said spitting facts. I'm not sure. But then she's like, <laughs> then I realized you're speaking facts because it's not like I'm just talking without any knowledge right, or insight. Like I'm, I have a lot of evidence, more evidence than people want to see um, to support my position and my conclusions. And people come to recognize that, you know, they come to recognize it regardless of how they're racialized. And it's a journey for people and it's a different journey for every different person. But I find nine out of 10 times, if you give me enough time with, with any person, they come to be persuaded to be eliminativists and, and seven out of 10 come to be skeptics. Like it's, it's real, it's real. Well, I mean, I've got a, a couple of statements and then a couple of questions. I mean, I really do feel like the way we do diversity now is it it is necessary that we create labels and that we segregate. And that's where I feel that we we aren't seeing the ind- the humanity or the individuality in the person. So I'm I'm loving this idea of this, you know, but my, I've, I need to ask you, what are some practical examples of how to eliminate race? So could you give me, and could you do this vis-a-vis how the construction, constructionists do it versus how the skeptics do it? Because I think yeah. we're used to hearing the constructionist view. Yeah. And so if, I, if you can lay those on top of each other so that we can kind of get more context, that would be great. <laughs> um, so, so Ibram X. Kendi, a pretty well-known constructionist, um, some people, many people actually identify him also as an eliminativist, which is the irony of, of, of how he does things and what I'm about to say. But as a constructionist, Kendi will look at any type of group, or if I'm a Kendian, right, if I'm a proponent of his type of anti-racism, I will look at any type of group, any group, and I will decide what your race is. Um, and based on how you look, based on very superficial things, phenotype, you know, skin color, hair texture, nose shape, all of these really stereotypical essentialist ways of thinking about race, I'm going to Um, help you either embrace your whiteness and thereby your complicity in racism. I'm going to encourage you to feel shame because to my mind, I'm pretending to be Kendi or a Kendian. To my mind, I think that shame is a good thing. And I think that even though you aren't your ancestors and even though systemic racism is what it is today, which is very different from what it's been, you still need to embrace the fact that you are white, you have privilege, you have power. Even if you are poor, you're still privileged by your whiteness. Oprah, with her infamous assertion of, I'm a billionaire, (laughs) but don't feel bad for white poor people because they still have their whiteness. Or LeBron James, another like sickeningly rich person, right, with sobbing on on social media because somebody put the N-word on his sidewalk or something and saying, you know, I might be rich, but I'm still Black, right? So you have the this, this type of practicing um, constructionism where, where people are inescapably, escapably seen and labeled to be inside race. And the premise is that from within the confines of race, we're going to solve the problem of racism. So you're white and how you help solve the problem is by embracing your whiteness and your privilege and recognizing how other people who are not racialized as white are disadvantaged, disempowered, um, and not privileged, right? We're on the opposite end of the spectrum. So I have students in in my class, in the early stages of my class who will say, what I'm about to say doesn't mean as much if if you black student over on the other side of the room disagree because what you say matters more because 
I'm white. I literally have a, had a student say that this semester. Um, and that's encouraged, that's embraced in fact, uh, because with this way of practicing this thing called anti-racism, what's expected is a sort of self-flagellating, you know, <laughs> um, self-flagellating demeanor and attitude, which also, by the way, has the impact of diminishing the power and value of the people it's supposed to be uplifting at the same time, right? It's diminishing all the way across the board because as a racialized white person who's now put neatly into the box of race and my whiteness, I am forced to speak and think about myself in ways that I might otherwise not be, not for the betterment of myself in society, but in a way that holds up the hierarchy that right. we're supposed to be dismantling. Right, it diminishes both the person who, uh, the, the, the we'll call so-called white person who has to uh, now put themselves in a mental box and say, um, I'm, I must operate out of this sort of paradigm of silence and deference and right. it diminishes the so-called black person who now who is also being essentialized and yep. and being treated um, as if they have a specialized knowledge, and right. it prevents them from it prevents them to from talking to each other now as equals because you've one one has been um, one is deferring and one is authoritative, and I right. think um, and neither of them are actually learning because they're yes. now both been regimented and essentialized in a way 100 percent, and it it maintains like tell me from that place where a person is supposed to go to undo racism it's like because also part of the part of the current practices it makes racism be something that it's that i question that i encourage people to interrogate such that it encourages people to really see racism everywhere because it encourages people to see race and color everywhere. I mean, of course we see color, but that's not the same thing as race. But because we're doing it from this praxis, we are encouraged to literally see racism everywhere. And racism, newsflash, is not everywhere, even though skin color and how we look and our differences is everywhere. Racism is not everywhere. So it makes us this almost insurmountable you know, a uh, project of trying to overcome and dismantle and end racism. But because we see racism everywhere, just imagine how hard, how much harder it's going to be to actually solve it. We will forever stay in the quagmire of racism because we're doing it in this way. And we're encouraging people to embrace race and to embrace their racialization and to recognize the value in other people being racialized. And it's like, no, it's counterintuitive, but that's how we're doing it. So how I would do it as a skeptical eliminativist, okay, as a skeptic, I first teach people the philosophies of race because it's not something that many of us are taught unless you just happen upon a Dr. Mason, you know, you're probably not going to be taught this stuff. So I teach people the philosophies of race and I emphasize the alternative philosophies of race that, you know, that too many of us are not familiar with, such as skepticism and eliminativism or constructionism and eliminativism. But I really try to lean people into skepticism. I do that by, cre by teaching them about it, talking about the history of um, thinkers, especially racialized Black thinkers, who have practiced and, and spoken from this sort of skeptical positionality. And once I've laid that foundation, I encourage people, participants, to operate from the skeptical position, meaning in this space, even if you want to throw everything I say in the trash when you leave the space, in this space, you are raceless. You are not fill in the blank. Anything, any ideas you have about yourself as a racialized person, I want you to put on the back burner of your minds right now. Like I want you to imagine yourself as raceless, which means imagine yourself exactly as, as you are, exactly as your beautiful self. Who are you outside of race? And people will have all of this rich stuff to say, hopefully, right? This is, <laughs> this is a spiritual and emotional journey. Who 
are you outside of your racial category? And now if you insert this idea of who you are as a racialized person, how does that change all of the beautiful things you just said about yourself? And, and I walk people through the process of thinking of who they are outside of race, what I call racism with the word race in it, right? Thinking of who they are outside of it as raceless. Now let's match this up to who you would say you are with race. And if who you are with race means as a racialized black person, it might mean who I am with race is a victim of racism in certain circumstances, right? That could be a very real thing. And who I am as a racialized white person might be, uh, might see myself as a perpetrator somehow of racism, whatever, you know, white privilege, all of the, the code speak that we te- we've taught each other to, to adopt. Then the question becomes, who would you rather be? This raceless, complete, holistic human being who participates in culture in all these really rich and interesting ways that cannot be racialized and pinned down, right? Versus um, being this racialized being who is a victim or, or seen as a perpetrator of racism, right? It's constricting. There are all kinds of rules like you've spoken about with Angel and Charles Love, all these rules that come with it right, that that really are a way to constrict who you are and how you are, which, which one would, which one makes the most sense for you, like, which one would help you feel like you can be yourself. And undoubtedly, people are going to be drawn to themselves without race. And now let's reverse engineer, how do we, how do we bring that into fruition? If you see yourself as a constructionist and you're not really vibing with, with skepticism right now, how do we get to that end goal? And you help people see, I help people see from a skeptical eliminativist positionality, the illogic of continuing to do it in the ways that we've been trained to do it under the guise of liberalism and progressivism and liberation and resistance. That's the irony of it. It's, it's comes packaged as that, but it has the exact opposite intended effect. And once you're able to walk people along this journey in this way, they come to the answers themselves, but more importantly, they stop upholding the problem by t- by teaching race, you are teaching racism. That is a true statement. And when people are given the toolkit to step outside of that, that dynamic, to step outside of that box, to recognize that as an individual, they have power. And as a larger community, they have power. Both things exist. Then they embrace it. Mm. And, and sure. then they have a, they get more creative about what the future can look like and what today can look like and how they should interact with people and how they shouldn't interact with people. And it should make, um, People who have considered themselves white start to question their racelessness as well. It's not, um, you know, and what that what that means. I think it's um, one one quite last question for me. Um, how so? How do you characterize racism? I mean, yes, you know, okay, the traditional the, the traditional way is it's it's white supremacy. It's um, but it sounds to me that your definition of racism is actually quite different. It's like the imposition of race is racism. Yeah, so the tradition- What you see is violence inherently. Yeah, so the more traditional, like Kendi, you know, definition, which he didn't invent, this is a definition that's been pretty standard, right? But he would say that racism is the belief in the, the superiority or inferiority of any race, right? That's his, that's a traditional definition. My definition is that racism is the belief in race (laughs) because race as a category itself is the hierarchy. So to say that it's um, that racism is the belief in the superior or inferiority is to say a belief in the hierarchy of race, which I think is redundant because race is the hierarchy itself. There's there is no way to be racialized in the American context anyway that doesn't include the hierarchy, which is why teaching race results in 
upholding the hierarchy, which is why you have the detractors of CRT rightfully saying more often than not, you're not about to teach my child that they're racist or that they're a, vi- a perpetrator. And you're not about to teach my child that they are a victim, that right. their ceiling is lower because of their race. That tells you that's part that's part of my evidence for how it's the same thing, because even when we talk about the problem of racism, we talk about it in the language of race. So that's how I've come to to define it for myself. And that's why I put the word race in my spelling of racism. So my anti-racism includes that same spelling and we could just shorten it to say anti-race. Right. I'm against the idea of race. And rightfully so, because the idea of race carries with it from its inception to now the hierarchy. Fascinating. You're breaking some new ground. I mean, I'm, I've got I've got to digest this for for a minute, Sheena. I hope this is the first <laughs> of many conversations. I'm a slow thinker. Um, wow. I mean, yeah. Okay. And it is also making me think a little differently too. So I I really appreciate that. Yes, Um, thank you to both of you. Let's continue this conversation for sure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hold My Drink. Like or subscribe to the show and check out the show notes for links to source material and to our website where you can find what each of us is reading every week. Different news with different views. If you have a topic that you would like us to explore, drop us a line. And join us next week as we say Hold My Drink and the conversation gets real.